you know, I'm not asking that much. I'd just like them to kill my zombie takeout before they serve it to me. What's up? Welcome to episode 407 of Zombie Ticket, the Be Moving Cult Movie Podcast. I'm John. And I'm Scotto. And before we get to this week's movie, we've got some listeners submitted from Bodo on Twitter. First, he tweeted, Titan A, great animation, great voice talent, was not shocked it only made $38.6 million and cost $76 million to make. <laughs> Remember when I complained about the music in Heavy Metal 2000? I take it back. <laughs> He, he also tweeted. I, was kind of, I kind of thought it was weird that he criticized the music of Heavy Metal 2000. I thought that was one of its saving graces. Yes, yeah, yeah, same. Um, he also tweeted, maybe you guys can help me with these unanswered questions. What was man going to become? Mimes. All of us <laughs> mimes. The mimes now are just ahead of the curve. Um, was the dredge, the on, on, was the dredge mem, mem, uh, mothership the only one? Um, yeah, they have to trade key or you know, share keys. It's awkward. The Genesis ship, or Titan ship, <laughs> created a planet and a sun that will stay in perfect orbit. Just repeat to yourself, it's just a show, I should really just relax. <laughs> and finally, why were all the alien races bipedal? Because Roddenberry. Yeah. And we'll get to more serious answers in the actual review. And on to that review, which is for this week's movie from 2000, Titan E, concluding our... Uh, science fiction, animated sci-fi, apparently from 2000. That was accidental. Uh, two-parter. Of course, that brings us to the impromptu pot summary, sponsored by the 90s. Somehow they seem, seem even more dated than the 80s. And also brought to you by Kid Tattoos. Need a safe hiding place for a key to save the entire human race? Tattoo your kid with a secret map. That because, pretty yellow beard. you know, no one's more careful about, you know, their skin than kids. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, we stagger left and then stagger right. As someone with uh, seven tattoos waiting on eight, um, on a kid, one would be gone in days. <laughs> that stagger, skin would be gone stagger, in days. Stagger, crawl, crawl. Uh, okay, uh, so we have... Uh, it's just, you know, the the Earth, it's uh, the 31st century, uh, this boy and his father, and uh, everything is just going so well until the planet was scheduled for de- demolition, <laughs> and no one told the, the humans. I was trying to think of a Douglas Adams reference for a title, but I couldn't come up with it. <laughs> right. I would have appreciated some Vogon poetry in this mm. movie, actually. <laughs> um, they, uh, however, uh, the boy's father did somehow know that the planet was going to be destroyed. And uh, rather than evacuate the planet right away, he worked on some ship that he stowed somewhere in the middle of nowhere. Uh, he hid this map on the on his uh, son's hand, uh, gave him a ring that, of course, you know, kids never lose shit, and uh, shoved him on another spaceship. Oh, you said then, shove. I was waiting for something I forgot about. <laughs> he he flew off and uh, never to be seen again. Mm. But uh, the kid, of course, grows up to be, I guess, a, a maintenance guy yeah. in some colony. M- uh, manual laborer. Yeah, and uh, of course that's not a good future, right? He he has to be the chosen one. <laughs> he has to be the person who can lead all of hum- mankind to uh, to a new planet, and he, he just ha- you know he has to find the 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 mark on his hand to lead him to it. So he runs in. Of course, well he has he to gets- find the thing that the mark on his hand is pointing to. To clarify that. Right, he gets help from the uh, person that was with his father when they left. Who couldn't possibly be the villain. <laughs> and honestly, did he even need to be? Did that <laughs> even make any sense? There Nobody somebody... screamed it from scene one. 
some of the crew knew it, but some didn't. It just, it was so dumb. Mm-hmm. But anyway, he, they, he's, he tells him about the map, uh, the, this uh, person that flew with his father and came back for some reason 15 years later. He, like, why wouldn't he do this when he was a kid yeah. if he had It'd the It'd be much easier to control. Process. Right, exactly. Um, they they go on some they they jump through some hoops from the MacGuffin because the MacGuffin doesn't just tell them right away where it's at. The MacGuffin tells them to go to some place to find out where the place is. Um, because they, they need to fill an entire movie, right? And so when they did this side quest, of course the dredge is attacked there too, and. Uh, they they escape. Um, they they find out the shocking truth, and um, which of course leads to them um, a hideous montage mm-hmm. of them uh, refurbishing a ship, which actually ended in cheering. Just a quick <laughs> uh, addition to Bodo's questions: What is the dredge dredged in? I would think flour, right? Yeah, I mean it's the, the obvious. You always dredge but... in flour. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I thought that without went without saying. It's probably why he didn't ask it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, just in case there was something else, I don't know. <laughs> so, they, um, I had to they, hear the name to get to connect that. Um, I really thought they were the law. Honestly, I was expecting Sylvester Stallone mm-hmm. to uh, to come in and lay down the law. Kind of looked like Romulans, at least the ships. The the mothership wasn't that just Optimus Prime's head? Pretty much. <laughs> it's like that's that's just Optimus Prime's head floating through space. This is this is Star Trek, and they when they encounter Lincoln's head. <laughs> but anyway, or oh, they encountered Abraham Lincoln. There was somebody's head they countered in space, and I can't remember what now. Hmm. That's gonna kill me. Um, <laughs> I think it was Lincoln, like POS, right? I think TOS, I think it was, they actually met Lincoln in space. Like he's yeah. just sitting right. in space for some reason, but I could have sworn they also met someone's head mm. in space. I don't know why <laughs> Lincoln was ridiculous enough, but yeah. anyway, uh, the montage, they have the, uh, first, I think they're going to do the, the asteroid scene from empire strikes back. It starts out that way only with ice crystals who only it turns into the nebula seed for wrath of God. <laughs> yeah. And then of course we, that leads us to project Genesis and hilarity ensues. Hmm. Starting with a bit of trivia um, in develop, the film was in development at 20th century Fox since 98 Titan. 8 was originally going to be a live action film. The script had passed around to various writers such as Ben Edlin, notable for creating The Tick, Joss Whedon, and Art Vitello, I don't know who he is, after three million had been spent in the film's early development with no progress. Wow. V- Vitello was sacked. The then chairman of 20th Century Fox, Bill Mechanic, gave the script to Fox Animation Studios creative heads Don Bluth and Gary Goldman, who were fresh from the success of their recent film Anastasia, which is actually quite good. I, I saw it a couple of years ago. Um, Mechanic had Wait no- a minute. They really call that a success, though? I mean, well, we, yeah. we had that movie in our theater. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, Mechanic had no scripts for Fox Animation Studios to work on and was faced with the choice of laying off animation staff uh, unless they took Titan, despite their experience with science fiction, Bluth and Goldman took this script regardless. Um, it was the second and final film produced by Fox Animation Studios after Anastasia. On the positive side, it was the first to be screened digitally. Okay. Um, my first note is genetic sci-fi. Generic sci-fi is generic. Yeah, this. They, they, why did they borrow so much? Like, with all that writing, and you know, this could have been a live action movie on its premise and its cast, Mm -hmm. but uh, wow, you can't. I guess maybe they were stealing that much eventually, and they thought they could just get away with it if they were doing a cartoon. It's you know, the family guy principle, although they'd have to pull off Akima's hair in live action and. Honestly, that was the most interesting thing in the movie. <laughs> I 
I mean, the animation is well done. Uh, yes. But I was right about that. I don't necessarily agree with him about the voice acting. It's it's cromulent. The the voice, the cast in this is fucking ridiculous. It's but the voice acting is fine. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a very but, mainstream cast for the time. Matt Damon, Drew Barrymore, um, playing an Asian character. Um, that doesn't need well. Yeah, like Ligazamo is pretty much doing like this. Oh, you're talking about you no, know, um, Barrymore. Drew Barrymore, um, Akima K- Kurimoto, I believe the last name is. It's never said in the film. Um, I Japanese character she was supposed to be Asian, but yeah, you're right. The name is very Japanese, so yeah, that doesn't age well. Um, Bill Paxton Pullman, one of them. Pullman. Um, Pullman, okay. Um, yeah. Tone Loke, Janine Garofalo, no one marks a movie as 90s more than Janine Garofalo. <laughs> but yeah, good animation, cromulent voice acting. It begins very Douglas Adams with the destruction of the Earth. I mean, the the cast is top-notch, but you could tell they are so slumming it and oh, just yeah, yeah, yeah. collecting a paycheck. Mm-hmm. I, I, Liguzamo is probably the most... And Brewer, Jim Brewer. As, like, the, as the cockroach chef, yeah. Right. The they, chef at this station is a cockroach. I did, I did get a kick out of that. Like, but his voice is so, like, I guess, I, I don't think that was his actual voice. I think they were manipulating it, Probably. which is, what's the point then, you know? why of hiring why? a name, yeah. Get Jim Brewer, who for can do some poster. really funny voices. Well, you get Jim Brewer for the poster because it was the ninety, like, it was two thousand, and he was still very popular. And I mean, Ligazamo, like, like the, he's pretty much playing Jar Jar Binks here. And if I, I don't know this in my notes, but from what I recall, it was like his first animation gig. Really? Yeah, I think it was one of Ligazamo's first animation gigs. Um, and that voice eventually led to Ice Age. And this had more to an Asian tint to it, which yeah. I thought was really weird too. Like, mm-hmm. why, why have him do that? And that, who would have thought any, that made any sense? And who would have thought that a male lead named after a leafy green vegetable would turn out to be boring? <laughs> His name is Cal. Which I, this I, is around the same time as Goodwill Hunting. So <laughs> I mean, what the fuck? It's the scene in um, what, which Mall Rats movie was it? Was it the third of them? Uh, oh, Strike Back, I think. Yeah, yeah, James Allen Bob Strike. Yeah, it back. was Strange Bob Strike Back. You you do the art film, you do the, the money film, you do the art film, you do the money film. <laughs> this was the money film. Now, the bigotry against humans in the future was an interesting angle. Woefully underexamined, but interesting. Yeah. Kind of kind of lazy, I thought. Well, it, they could have done something interesting with stuff. that. Yeah. It could have been interesting if they had done anything with it other than establish, yes, humans are, you know, big, are the, sub, are the uh, victims of bigotry in this future. We're all and, down then, on. and then, of course, you really don't want them to examine it because the answer in the end is for humans to just go someplace else and terraform it and start their own thing yeah, all right. over again. Fair point, fair point. So, I mean, no. Yeah. A separate but equal, if you will. Yeah, so fair no, point, fair let's point. not examine that. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> it means um, better that they did not well, get deeper into that. I'm saying if go deeper into that and take the movie in a different direction. True. But now, on the again, on the positive side, the uh, planet uh, Shasharan, where the, the planet they have to go to to figure out how to get where they're actually going, the place with all the humanoid bats, yeah, did remind me of some areas of WoW, and this is four years before WoW, so probably an influence on it. Got to give it credit for that. Kind of reminded me of Space Ghost a little bit. <laughs> well, yeah, the 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 dredge or the the the, the what, I forget what they were called. The, the aliens on that planet. Yeah, I forget. What they but yeah, they kind of were, were a bit Space Ghost. Um, did the other last movie have some Space Ghost animation too around the yeah, same time? Yeah, I mean, Space Ghost was very influential. They were. They were. Um. Now, I thought the outside of the dredge ship were very interesting, very kind of sleeker bird of prey. The insides were just fucking crystals and steel. Yeah. They loved their crystals in this uh, movie. Yeah, yeah. Fucking crystals. And there's a scene in the dredge ship on the, when he's there in the mothership when the dredge leader is saying, you know, jettison the girl because Akima and Cal both get pulled in. Yeah. And we know we, the, the dredge is saying that because of the subtitles. 
Somehow, somehow Kel understands Kel it. knows it, yes. Like, he's reading the subtitles, too. I was looking for the fish in his ear, honestly. Yeah, yeah. And I may have nodded off a bit when they were rescuing Akuma. <laughs> you might—you actually missed one of the best parts of the movie, I think. The, okay. the intelligent guard. Oh, I did catch... Yeah, I kind of va- vaguely remember that part. The guard's Subtle asking... If, they're trying to, you know slip past a guard assuming he's going to be stupid and he asks if he's meant too, too many questions and he you know he points out all the flaws in their story yeah. but of course i mean he winds up just getting right. belted anyway uh-huh. <laughs> i did like the wake angel scene at least visually it was interesting you know any scene there in traveling through space and in space was great yeah. it was solid animation mm. And then the second they landed on planets or showed interiors... As soon as there was dialogue. It was a Hanna-Barbera cartoon. (laughs) What what the fuck are you guys doing? And as much as I expected Kit Corso's... I keep keep on to sound call him Kelso. Um, As much as I expected Corso's heel turn, it still seemed abrupt. Well, yeah. And and like I said, did it really make any sense? Was it even necessary to have... Like, isn't it enough for, for mankind to be fighting for its very existence? And <laughs> have since he is human, and since you suspect him from scene one, it would have been better if he didn't turn, if Preed, his first mate, just turned. Yeah. We didn't mention Nathan Lane, did we? No, his, of course his first mate is uh, an alien named Preed, played by Nathan Lane. Uh, Which was kind of unexpected to see him turn up in this. Yeah, yeah. It was an unusual you know, choice of you know voice for that character and that appearance. Mm. And somehow, of course, those sensors are fooled by the Hall of Mirrors trick. <laughs> in Star Trek, it works because it's a nebula. The gas right. gets in the way. This is just a bunch of crystals in space. Yes. Crystals on top of crystals on top of crystals. And, although I think Cal finding the toy on the... On, the, the Titan was a nice touch. Um, and I liked how when it was lit up, it kind of looked very Da Vinci. Now, we, now that we mentioned about, you know, the human race and mm-hmm. having to go off on their own, wouldn't this movie have been so much better if the Titan device didn't work? Yeah. It would have been a nice little last minute, what the fuck do we do? It would have taken the plot in an interesting direction. And then maybe some other alien race can come along and give us a hand and yeah, yeah. we can fight our way out of it kind of thing. Or, it's, you know, this we, whole, we're just going to go to our corner. Or an alien race shows up, you know, we, we, you know, form a relationship with that race. They decide humans aren't so bad. And, yeah. you know, it's a whole, glo- you know, intergalactic community thing. Right. <laughs> um, I was a bit surprised by Preed's heel turn. Um, I thought that was a little a little surprising. Um, seeing Kale have to go get in, an, and this is something in sci-fi that's all the time, it's a thing in reality, having to get into an EV suit to go outside of the ship was a fucking mood these days. <laughs> <laughs> Where can I get one of those? And also, who's your daddy, groom's your daddy, still cracks me up. I did get a kick out of that line. <laughs> Leave it to Ligazama. Yeah, yeah. Um, of uh, course. I mean, come on, how about him surviving that blast? Oh, of course, because somebody has to come back and be the savior at the last but minute. At and at it's the guy you it, think is already dead. At least have him have them draw it where it's clear that he's throwing it somewhere or putting it in something. He just goes down a hall, blows up, and then yeah. there he is like... Ugh. Under a door. It's like, how would his body be in one piece even? It's a cartoon. Wouldn't it have been better if, like, he just ate it? (laughs) It blew up inside of him. Well, that's what you think. uh, You're expected to think he's dead. But who did? Well, yeah. Um, Once you didn't see that his body wasn't blown to bits, you knew uh, he was alive then. Yeah. Uh, Amongst other things we saw coming a mile away, of course, his sacrifice. Yeah. I mean, that's just cliche. Um, I did like that they showed the Titan pulling in all of the, the particles, all the elements to build the planet. It was a nice yeah. little scientific touch. 
Um, and to Bodo's point, I mean, obviously, how did it, you know, to Bodo's point about the star, where the fuck did that come from? How did it establish an orbit? <laughs> blah, blah, blah. But also to his point about the dredge and that was that their only mothership, it implies that all of the dredge, every dredge was killed in that battle. Wow. Because what else, you know, why aren't they coming after us? Why isn't there a dun 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 at the end? Which you kind of expect, you know. You, you, the you implication were... is that every dredge was killed in that battle, which makes it a genocide. Yeah. Well, I guess that's what it was. It was genocide against genocide, unless they had some. That's true. They of, were trying to genocide us. So. Unless they had some sort of oracle that that told them that we were going to commit genocide on them, mm-hmm. unbeknownst that their attempt to commit genocide on us caused their own genocide. Yeah, I just think that we were just going to be too powerful for them to control, and eventually there was going to be a thing, and you know, once we went out far enough and they just had, weren't going to win if we developed much further. It's a genocide inception. Yeah, basically. Um, by the way, if I ever complain about a soundtrack in a movie ever again, remind <laughs> me of this one. Yeah. This was really, this is one of the worst soundtracks I think we've seen. Although we dodged a bullet because the trailer has higher by Creed. It's pretty much the only sound in the trailer until Mr. Voice comes in later. That would have been an improvement actually over what they've got here. I mean, think, think of how on the nose some of these songs were yeah it's my time to fly that, well that song I, I actually do like that song I, I liked it back in the day it's still kind of nostalgic for me um, yeah but where uh, they were playing it the scene they were playing well, it, it over it, the right. lyrics are specifically about the movie right it, it was written for the movie about the movie that's what I was afraid of <laughs> just so ugh, ugh. it's all on the nose but musically, I kind of like it. Um, and that wasn't the only example of that. There were a few <laughs> other songs where it was just like on the nose lyrics for the. I there's a lot of this movie where I was expecting to find Scooby Doo <laughs> and the gang to like. I mean, because it was just very Hanna Barbera. Oh yeah, yeah. And I remember when those chase songs that they would have that were just like <laughs> terrible, <laughs> terrible music yeah. that they just did for the show that were kind of knockoffs. Uh-huh. And I did expect that, the, that percussion instrument that, you know, when you see them running in air. Oh, I yeah. was not, I was surprised they didn't use that. On a sequel and remix. And then the score, the non-soundtrack songs, uh-huh. the score was like a 1980s film. I mean, it was pretty much. Wasn't paying attention to the score. It was pretty much like a Star Trek, you know, mm-hmm. Star Wars score. And they even used like the whale song to do like the place cards, like yeah. it was Voyage Home. It, mm-hmm. it just wow. Yeah. Sequels and remakes, I would say fuck no. <laughs> A video game adaption by Blitz Games was planned to be released for the PlayStation and PC in the fall of 2000 in North America, following the film's summer release. Development on both platforms had begun in March '99 under the film's original title, Planet Ice. And oh. an early playable oh. version was showcased at the 2000 E3. Uh, in July 2000, a spokesman for the game publisher, Fox Interactive, announced that development on the title had been halted largely due to the film's poor box office performance, which was, quote, only one of many different factors that led to its cancellation. I mean, this really... This deserved to kill that that animation studio, like <laughs> that they would produce this with all this money. Like, th- let's compare now. Now we're, we're comparative this to, to Heavy Metal two thousand, uh-huh. which I wasn't all that keen on. Right, but my God, they 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 probably had about the tenth of the budget of this. Yes. And Michael Ironsides was a big get for them and Julie Strange and. I'll, I'll, I'll interrupt my sequels and remakes for a minute. You know, I will admit, see, um, on a quality level, on an objective quality level, they're not that different. Hmm. The only difference is Heavy Metal 2000 is a lot more fun. <laughs> right. I think, like, if you had that, this cast an animation for Heavy Metal 2000, I, I think it would have been a much better movie. It would have been amazing. I only get, I only recommended um, Heavy Metal 2000 because it's ridiculous and fun. You know, yeah. In terms of its overall quality, it's kind of crap. 
This has a lot more money. Its overall quality isn't much better. Visually, yes. But beyond that, no. And it's no fun. (laughs) Yeah, this is watching a rerun, pretty much. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Um, More sequels and remakes. To tie in with the film, two prequel novels by Kevin J. Anderson and Rebecca Moesta were released in February uh, of 2000 by Ace Books, the same day as the official novelization of the film. Uh, a Dark Horse comic series spoken, focusing on the character Sam was also released. I don't remember Sam. Yeah. Uh, uh, in May. Kevin J. Anderson wrote some very good Star Wars books, and then he wrote two prequels to this. This is one of uh, Charles Rocket's last uh, movies. Oh, God. <laughs> so, on to Brains. Yeah, on to Brains. This, to me, is pretty much the definition of meh. <laughs> but it's pretty, so I'll bump it up a half a brain and give it a three. Nah, I... <laughs> I, I can't even give it two, honestly. I'll, okay. I'll go with one and a half, because... Okay. You you can't lift that much. I mean, you know, heavy metal lifted some things here and there. Mm-hmm. Things were an in, uh, influence and, and heavy more metal of a did homage. it with a wink. What's up? Heavy metal did it with a wink. Right. This, I mean, they were taking lines from Star Wars. Like, yeah. would it help if I get outside and push? Yeah, directly. And then the scene where they were attacking Titan, it was just pretty much the Death Star attack scene only with the good guys being inside the bed the space station and the bad guys attacking mm. uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna go with a, a single brain because there were some okay. nice looking uh space scapes and uh i don't know <laughs> to me it was just kind of their wallpaper but it was pretty wallpaper so i'm going a little above right, right down the middle to reenact um, that that nebula scene so closely also was okay. just that was ridiculous. <laughs> so what have we learned? Uh all dogs may go to heaven, but I think they should block Don Bluth for this. <laughs> <laughs> and I learned that even hair ge- that somehow hair gel will survive the destruction of the earth. Of course. Oh nineties. Gotta keep that hair <laughs> intact. And that's it for Titan A. Mercifully, my prediction was correct. I hate it now. I really don't like it now and I love <laughs> Heavy Metal 2000 somehow. Um, we're off next week because I overextended myself next mo- last month and I need a week off. Yeah. I think I think we've earned it. <laughs> and so two weeks from now when we'll be reviewing Karis Hell. How is that for Punching H? Ah, that's good. That's good. And I'm really looking forward to this one. <laughs> um, Jen might be joining us assuming schedules and technology work out. Until then, of course, always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life, there you are. There you are. (laughs) 